I'm going to speak um, uh, 20 to 25 minutes, and no more, about solutions journalism, what it is, what it is not, why it is something uh, that is uh, important for journalists to use, and then we're going to open it up to discussion and uh, comments and questions. So, um, the case for solutions journalism. Because I'm a journalist, I'm going to start out with a story. A lot of houses in the United States that are fairly old were painted with a paint containing lead. The paint chips, little kids eat the chips. They have, get brain damage and that can never be reversed. So it's a very serious condition and it's very expensive to do anything about it because you have to take all the paint, you can't just paint over it. So a lot of cities have a big problem with lead paint. Cleveland is one of the worst. The Plain Dealer newspaper had done two series on uh, the problem of lead paint investigative series in the last 12 years. And both of them were examples of great investigative journalism. Neither of them produced any of impact whatsoever. So we at the Solutions Journalism Network worked with them to help them do a different kind of series on lead. This one was called Toxic Neglect. It had two parts. One part was the traditional investigative part. And they did a series, uh, the investigative part focused on the problem of, of lead through the lens of race. But they also did a solutions part. And the effect of the solutions part was to take a problem that was seen as unavoidable and turn it into a problem that was unacceptable. And, and here's how they did it. They introduced the series this way. Other cities are tackling this problem with cost-effective prevention strategies. We'll tell you exactly how those programs work and what they might cost and what's keeping Cleveland from adopting these smart solutions as a way to protect our children. So they went to Rochester, which is not that far from Cleveland, um, and looked at what Rochester was doing that was working. Rochester is a city that was doing very well with this issue. That was the only trip they took. The rest of their reporting was uh, over the phone. Um, they talked to folks who live in, um, in Philadelphia, in Akron, in Grand Rapids, in Washington, D.C., and other places, because each of them was doing well against a small piece of the lead problem. For example, one city was testing children in schools. Another city had succeeded in creating a registry of houses. So they looked at these small slices, and they had, just to annoy public officials to the maximum, they had this chart in the paper that said, here's what successful cities do, and here's what Cleveland does. So, you can imagine that, that this was profoundly embarrassing to public officials. People who run Cleveland could no longer say, we're doing the best we can. It can't be solved, because both of those things are obviously now not true. So the effect of this was profound. Uh, they fired the uh, director of the health department and most of the commissioners. They fired most of the <coughs> inspection staff. The staff doubled. The city passed some of the best practices that were going on in other places. The state cracked down on Cleveland, and et cetera, et cetera. So this series had a profound effect on how Cleveland deals with the problem of lead. Bree Zeltner, who was one of the reporters on this story, said this. In the past, we've had many stories that pointed out the problem, but none used what was working elsewhere to remove the many local excuses that were preventing the conversation from moving from what we can't do to what we can do. The only thing that ever came of previous stories was a politician or two talking about how bad the problem was. This is solutions journalism. Um, we, um, I'm here as a representative of the Solutions Journalism Network, which is an organization that's five and a half years old. We have about 40 staff around the United States and in increasingly various other parts of the world. We have a representative for Europe who lives outside of Paris and not France. Um, and we have informal representatives for Europe here with the Shoka and Transitions who do a lot of training themselves with solutions journalism. Um, so in the, when we started at SJN, we chose the most prestigious and, and uh, visible newsroom partners we could find. And some of you met David Boardman who uh, was here um, in the spring. David was the executive editor of the Seattle Times, a very widely respected newspaper in America, which was known for its investigative work 
and he really adopted the solutions journalism uh, practice. And we were happy with that because we wanted the credibility and visibility that that, that had. Now that has turned into a liability for us because most news organizations in the United States are small and broke and local. And we don't want them looking at the Seattle Times and saying, oh, well, they can do solutions journalism. The Cleveland Plain Dealer can do it, but we can't do it in our newsroom because we're too small and too broke and too local. So now we work with the small, broke, and local. Um, so we have several networks in the Mountain West now, one in New Mexico, one in Montana. We have a collaboration with various different news organizations in Philadelphia, including the major paper and a, and a broadcast television station, but also lots of small news organizations. And we're helping them do <coughs> solution stories um, with, their, with the resources that they have, which is very important because dwindling resources are, are a problem everywhere in the United States, in the Czech Republic, and everywhere else. Um, a little bit about my history and how I came to this. The um, SJN grew out of a column that David Bornstein, my co-founder, and I write in the New York Times, and it's called Fixes. Every week, and this has been running since 2010, every week we look at a different response to a social problem, any issue, anywhere. Um, for example, worldwide teaching program to stop rape, that's a recent example. So the reason that fixes came about, uh, for me anyway, was this. In the year 2000, I was working for the Sunday Magazine of the New York Times, and I pitched my editor on a story on the issue of the price of HIV medicines in poor countries. And the fact that in countries where the burden of AIDS was the highest, the prices of medicine were the highest, sometimes higher in Africa than in Europe, for example. And what was a chronic and manageable disease in wealthier countries was still a death sentence in the places that needed these drugs the most. That was widely known. What was not widely known was why. And the reason was collusion between the pharmaceutical manufacturers and the Clinton administration in Washington, um, really every US administration, not particular to the Clintons, to put political <coughs> pressure on countries not to make or buy generic versions of drugs. If you did that, you were considered violating intellectual property, you were put on a trade watch list, et cetera, et cetera. So I pitched this to my editor. I thought this is a pretty important investigative story. And he said, no. Too depressing and too familiar. Everybody knows that everyone with AIDS is going to die in Malawi. We don't want to inflict another long story on our readers telling them that. So I went home and I rethought the story. There was one country that was making these drugs for free, defying the pressure from Washington, and giving these drugs out to all their people for free who needed them. They weren't making them for free, they were giving them out for free, and that was Brazil. So the piece became what Brazil was doing and the effects it was having. And in the course of telling that story, I said everything else I wanted to say about the bad behavior and what Brazil had to fend off. So this was a much different approach, and it had several advantages over the old approach got into the paper, first of all. Um, very important. How to solve the world's AIDS crisis. I did not write that headline. I think it's overclaiming. But they gave it a lot of good play, and it had a tremendous response. It felt empowering to readers. This was a long story about AIDS in the year 2001 that readers felt excited and empowered to read. Didn't want to make them go back to bed and put the covers over their head. It helped to change the debate from can poor countries give their people antiretroviral medicines to how can poor countries everywhere do what Brazil has done? Because there was now a model. That made me realize the power of the solutions journalism approach. Whenever I wrote about a topic that was considered too depressing, which was almost all the time. So um, that's how we came to found the Solutions Journalism Network. So what is solutions journalism? Um, this is an example of one of, of, actually the first piece we did with our first partner, the Seattle Times, Education Lab. Seattle, evidently, despite its reputation as a tech city, has terrible public education. And they were tired of writing the same story over and over again. So they now started EdLab, which is a package of stories every month about something that works in education in Seattle. And this says, for years, students at White Center Heights Elementary School logged some of the lowest test scores in King County. Then teachers tried something new, and the numbers soared by double digits in just one year. So what happened, and could it be replicated elsewhere? That's uh, an example of solutions journalism. Here's another example. 
This is a very brief one minute and 30 second story of local TV news in New York City about a violent housing project, Queensbridge, that had just gone a year with no shootings. How did they do it? Here's another example. This is a hospital in the Los Angeles area that had gone from one of the worst in terms of hospital infections to middle of the pack. Not great, but they had improved drastically. How did they do it? <coughs> so those are examples of solutions journalism. I'd like to talk about a few examples of what solutions journalism is not. Things that people think, this is solutions journalism, but that's not what we think it is. And so these are some imposters. One imposter is silver bullet stories. Um, these are stories that overclaim, like the headline of my AIDS story. This was a story about a soccer ball that never deflates. The headline was something like, it's a lifesaver, or something like that. I mean, sorry, but no. Instead of doing that, a real solutions journalism story tones down the rhetoric and is conservative in its claims. Um, it looks, it sticks to what the evidence says that you can do. By the way, I can provide this PowerPoint to anyone who wants it, you know, in case you're interested. Uh, hero worship stories. Hero stories are stories that praise people for their good intentions, their, uh, their grand gestures, their, for example, someone who quits his lucrative job on Wall Street and moves to Africa to go work with the poor. Very nice. Not solutions journalism, because we have no idea whether what you did had any effect or not. A real solutions journalism story uses the characters to talk about work when we know that work has evidence that it's made a difference. That's, that's the difference. Favor for a friend. Here's a nice NGO. Let's write something nice about it. This story about Tom's shoes has the first sign, the first line, the idea was genius. This sounds like a story that could have been written by Tom's shoes. That's not solutions journalism. So the real thing shows not only what's working, but what is not working. There is no such thing as a perfect program. If you claim that there is, no one will believe you anyway. So write about the downsides, write about the limitations. This is an important distinction. A think tank story is one where the journalist says, here's how I think this problem should be solved. It's recommending stuff. Real solutions journalism, by contrast, reports on what people are doing to try to solve a problem. It's not theoretical. It's going out there and reporting on something. It's just reporting the news, basically. But there's no recommendations involved. There's no theory involved. There's no future-oriented involved. It's just saying, here's what's happening, and here's the results we're seeing. Afterthought. This is a story about the prison industrial complex in the United States. And quite clearly, what happened was, the director said, oh my gosh, we've spent, we've spent our almost entire 90 minutes <coughs> depressing the hell out of people. We need to say something, that there's stuff going on, that people are trying to do something about this problem. So it mentioned a few things. But it didn't talk about what any of those programs were doing, what evidence they were having of success. It didn't really look in depth at the solutions. Therefore, not solutions journalism. Instant activist, another imposter. These are stories that tell you, the reader, how you can become part of the solution. Or worse, they talk about the paper becoming part of the solution. Um, that's not what solutions journalism does. Solutions journalism is just plain old reporting the news. Some news organizations are comfortable with adding on the, the instant activist part. Personally, I'm not, but that's the, that's the choice of the news organization. But that's not what we're talking about. And finally, my favorite, our house mascot at SJN, Crispy Bacon, the disabled pig, I don't even know why people think this is solutions journalism. <laughs> it, they're, they're inspiring. They make you feel good about the human condition. But real solution stories are insightful. They offer important insights about how a problem is being responded to. They may or may not be inspirational as well, but that's not, that's not the key. So here's what solutions journalism is, the four qualities. It features not just characters, but the work the hero of the story is the work. What is the response to the problem, and how did it happen? Second, evidence. We're interested in effectiveness, not just good intentions. Third, insights, not just inspiration. And fourth, don't look like a PR piece. Talk about the limitations. So 
that's what we're talking about. Here's the case for why you should consider using solutions journalism in your work. It can make your reporting more impactful. I've gone through a lot of that already with the Cleveland story and with my AIDS story. It was the solutions part of those that gave them the impact. Journalism's normal theory of change is this. We expose wrongdoing. Then someone will come in and change things. How many of you are happy with how well that's worked so far? Very occasionally that happens, but not, not always. Uh, and not, not even most of the time. Simply pointing out a problem does not necessarily lead to reform. So, Rhiannon Myers wrote a series on, on diabetes in uh, the Corpus Christi, Texas, Caller Times. This is the county in America with the highest rate of amputations from diabetes. And you can read what she said. Some of her series was solution stories. They were the most controversial, they ruffled the feathers of providers in this community who had grown used to the status quo and weren't expecting to be challenged. Just talking about how bad the diabetes problem was in Corpus Christi would not have done the same thing. Second advantage, it's just better journalism. Do you remember Ebola? How many people here heard about Ebola, the Ebola epidemic in 2014? Everyone, right? Billions of people around the world heard about Ebola. How many of you heard that there were countries in Africa, like Senegal, Mali, and Nigeria, who had single digit or double digit uh, Ebola outbreaks and then controlled them, contained them. Not a lot of people know about that. How many of you know that there's a vaccine for Ebola that's 100% effective? It's true. That's how they ended the last epidemic. I would think, I would hope that some of the billions of people who knew about this part also know about this part, but that's a small percentage. This is important stuff. We are leaving out important, critical information that society needs to be able to change if we don't report on solutions. Our motto at SJM is the whole story. Third, it can increase your audience engagement and trust. So the American Press Institute, which is a highly reputable um, independent organization, did a study of the Seattle Times Ed Lab series looking at at the Ed Lab stories and comparing them to comparable traditional focus education stories. And they found that the Ed Lab stories had double the page views, 80% more time on page, more than triple the social shares, and a very high rate of people coming back to the paper to read more stories. Um, the Guardian has a new uh, solutions vertical called The Upside. One, this kind of stories they run, one in 10 people who read one of these stories shares them. That's a very high rate of social shares. Um, the most shared video on the New York Times website in 2017 was a fixes video. I, I'm not a videographer and I didn't make this video, but it's a fantastic video about a water park in San Antonio, Texas, where even severely disabled children can play alongside their able-bodied friends. So um, the Writers Institute does a digital news report every year, and they found what many, many researchers have found, that the reason people avoid news is because the main reason by far is it has a negative effect on my mood. <coughs> people turn out. In a 2008 AP study found the same thing. News fatigue brought many of the participants to a learned helplessness response, and they went back to bed and put the covers over their head. But when they think there's something that can be done about a problem, they tune back in again. They're more attentive and receptive to the information. Um, more shared. Uh, most emailed list, positive content was more viral than negative content. Uh, positive content reaches larger audiences than negative ones, which is counterintuitive for many editors and reporters who assume that it's negative news that, that readers want. A study by the BBC World Service of its under 35 digital audience, their top content request was more solutions journalism. The New York Times did a study of its mobile users, who are not young, but younger than people who read the New York Times in other ways, and their top content request was actually more weather, but their second was more solutions journalism. 
Um, the University of Texas did a study comparing uh, two stories. One was a traditional story, and the next one was the same story with added content that was solutions oriented. And look, you can see the difference in how readers responded. I think the interesting one is the second one. I would read more articles from the same newspaper. I would get involved in working towards a solution. I would share the article. So a, a very important reason that's new for solutions journalism is trust. We in America have a big problem with lack of trust in the news. Um, I know it's the same here in the Czech Republic. It's really the same everywhere. People don't like us very much, and we can't understand why that could be. Um, and there's several different reasons for that. But there's one interesting reason that doesn't get talked about much, and that's story selection. I went to Alabama to um, do a training at the uh, Montgomery Advertiser, which is a, a small paper. And Alabama's in the south of the United States, in the Bible Belt. And, and I asked people there, what do you guys think of mainstream media coverage of Alabama? And they all said, it's terrible. Hate it. We hate it. Well, why? And they said, because you always run stories that make us look like ignorant yahoos. You always look for the people who have four teeth. Um, and I said, OK. What's inaccurate about that? Um, they were a little offended by the way I phrased that question. But, and they said, actually, it's not inaccurate. We do do things that make us look like ignorant yahoos. But we also do things that don't. And you're not interested in reporting on them. You're only interested in your stereotype of us and reporting about things that confirm that stereotype. The same is true if you go to inner city neighborhoods in Chicago, for example. They are tired of journalists coming in and reporting on gun violence. They acknowledge this is a big problem. Obviously, they live it every day. But they would like it for people to also report on what they're doing about gun violence and also things in their lives that are not about gun violence, because there is more to their life than that. People do not feel respected or reflected by the news media. And that cuts into trust. That is one reason that people don't like us very much. They say, you are always out to try to make us look bad. Uh, this was a focus group that, we, that um, the Tau Center from Columbia University did with people from, uh, from south of Los Angeles, a um, neighborhood of heavily African American and Hispanic. Whoever thinks themselves to be marginalized does not like the news very much. Um, and that is, that is truly unfortunate. Fourth reason. It can increase revenue. Um, this is a small paper in, in Ohio, a small town called uh, Mansfield, Ohio, the Richland Source. <coughs> they do a lot of solutions journalism. And they recently put out a call to local businesses and said, we're doing a fund so we can have a pool of money to do solution stories. Can you contribute to that? And we'll give you a nice, we'll give you a nice mention. Basically, advertising. They got 70 close to $70,000 in a month, $67,000, which for them is a lot of money. So yeah, they ran this on their website. Aligning their brands with rigorous, responsible work that has a viable impact on our community. Uh, businesses like to advertise next to innovation and new ideas and people doing things that work for their community. That's, that's important. Another way people are using this to raise money is through foundation grants. Silver Linings is a series in a paper in New Hampshire that used to have eight reporters in the newsroom and now has 11. And they raised the money from foundations, local foundations, for those three more positions. And they did that by saying, we want a person to report on aging, we want one to report on opioids and mental health, and we want one to report on economic development. And all those beats are going to have a strong solutions component. And they raised the money to fund three new positions. They increased the size of their newsroom by nearly 40%. EdLab sells sponsorship, Alaska Airlines. Then they created a newsletter around EdLab and sold sponsorship for the newsletter. So there's many ways that journalists in the United States are using solutions journalism to raise revenue that they would not otherwise have access to. And in today's very lean times, that's extremely important. So one of the reasons that journalists are hesitant to, to do solutions journalism sometimes is that in our profession, if you say something is a problem and it turns out you're wrong, you've committed a minor crime, a misdemeanor, according to journalists. It's not the way the public sees it, but that's the way we see it. 
If you say something is working and you got it wrong, you've committed a felony. That's a major crime. The worst thing that a journalist can do is look too soft, like they're doing PR, like they're captive of their sources. And journalists are really scared to, to come out looking like that. So we found that the journalists don't like reading negative, don't like writing negative story after negative story any more than audiences like reading them, but they're afraid to try solutions journalism because they're afraid it'll come out looking like cheerleading or like advocacy or like fluff. And so our job at Solutions Journalism Network oops, is to show them how to do that kind of reporting with high standards. And so we do workshops in newsrooms um, to, to show them that. We've been going to a newsroom, we'll do a three hour workshop, and then we'll stay and work with a small group that's doing a specific project and that they want to either make a solutions project or add a solutions component to. So um, one of the tools that I think is most interesting, and I'm going to close here, is our solution story tracker. This is on our website. And it's a collection of solutions <coughs> journalism. Some of it from our partners, some of it that we just stumbled across. And a lot of people do this without knowing that it's called something. I mean, this is, we didn't invent this. So it's out there. It's out there a lot more now than it used to be. But right now we have nearly 4,600 stories in the tracker and we're adding more every day. And you can search it by many different things. By what issue this is, success factor, what made this work. By the name of the journalist, the news outlet, the location, the sustainable development goal that's associated with it. Is it a neighborhood project or a city project or a national project? Is it, is it broadcaster or a radio or, or text? How long is it? Et cetera, et cetera. It's a very, very useful resource, not only for journalists, but for people who are looking for information on what's working out there. We also have toolkits to help people learn about solutions journalism, and I'm very proud to present something that Ashoka and Transitions facilitated, our check toolkit. Yay. Mm -hmm. So this has been out for about a month, and I encourage you all to, to dive into it. So um, thank you so much for coming.